Okay. Um, okay. Hi, uh, a warm good morning to our viewers. I, Shruti Suresh, educator from Space Chennai, on behalf of our entire team, wish you a happy National Science Day. I thank everyone for celebrating this glorious day with us, and I welcome you all for the live interaction with someone who is an astronomer, astrophysicist, professor, and many more, Dr. Priya Hassan Ma'am. She is an as uh, assistant professor at Maulana Azad National Urdu University, Hyderabad. She did her integrated master's from Moscow State University, Russia, PhD at Osmania University, Hyderabad, and a postdoctoral research in France and Ayuka, Pune. A moment of pride for her when she was awarded the Woman Scientist Award by the Department of Science and Technology in 2006. She has presented her work at various conferences in India, Europe, the US, and Vienna. Her research interests are observational astronomy, star formation, star clusters, and galaxies. But apart from the research work, she has dedicated her time and energy to Olympiads, public outreach, and uh, science popularization programs. She has also worked on various projects with uh, International Astronomical U Union, IAU, US Consulate Hyderabad, etc. Currently, she is also the co-chair of the Women in Astronomy Working Group of IAU and a member of ISDT 30-meter telescope. I could keep on going as her accomplishments are sky high. So now, without any further delay, I welcome Dr. Priya Hassan to the session. Thanks, Ruthie. Thanks so much. Thank you, ma'am. Hi, ma'am. How are you? Fine, fine. I'm good. Thank you. Actually, this is a dream come true for me, ma'am. I have followed your work for some time, and I should also call you a little fan uh, since I participated in one of the programs uh, you conducted, like Winter School of Astronomy in Hyderabad. And mm -hmm. I have uh, majored in astrophysics, and I uh, I have participated in the Shishri Astronomy's uh, archival data. Basically, TopCat has helped me go through my uh, project. Like throughout my project, TopCat was uh, really helpful. So I really thank you for conducting uh, such workshops, ma'am. Thanks so much. Thanks. Uh, so uh, I would like to ask you one question, if you don't mind. Uh, what is your vision behind the hands-on session and the public outreach programs you have conducted now? Yeah, so uh, basically, um, you know, uh, uh, there's a lot of astronomy material available on the internet. If you Google, yeah. you'll obviously find a lot of things ranging from all topics that could interest you, like you know, exoplanets or galaxies or the universe, etc. But the difference in doing uh, hands-on sessions was, you know, what we thought is that you should actually have a feel of using astronomy data, what kind okay. of data is available, how do you analyze? For example, how can you find the mass of a black hole inside a galaxy, right? Yeah. A program on that too. So you can actually calculate it using data available. So the idea was basically to give people, a, you know, a real experience of astronomy data so that they realize the scientific process. You know, there's okay. a certain scientific process through which we actually derive these parameters for which you need to understand what are the assumptions we make some of them could be you know could be controversial but uh, basically the scientific process because i think that is very important for people to understand that after all it's yes, a scientific sir. endeavor you're actually doing it scientifically it's not that you are taking values that i tell you because you are yeah. because i am like forcing my opinion on you Nothing yes. of that kind. It is purely, uh, you know, what I actually derive. And hence, okay. if you actually see the hands-on sessions, uh, tomorrow if there's some other data, there's data mm -hmm. from James Webb, for example, yeah. you can actually okay. use that and derive and get the values on your own. So that's the basic okay. idea. To I think to demonstrate the scientific process, which astronomy obviously follows, so that you understand how do we actually, you know, find out parameters or things. Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you, ma'am. And actually, our thoughts are also similar uh, as we from Space India. We're also trying to provide better learning opportunities through experiments, hands-on sessions, and that too from a tender age, right? From the schools, we are uh, we are giving them opportunity to learn about uh, astronomy and astrophysics, ma'am. Now, I don't want to uh, bore our viewers with my talk, so hand I hand over the session to the star of the program, uh, Dr. Priya Hassan, ma'am. Uh, now you can take over, ma'am. Thanks so much, Shruti. Thanks. Thank you. I'll just share my presentation. Yes, ma'am. I hope you can see it fine. All good? Yes, ma'am. It's just good. Yeah. 
So the theme of this session is global science for global well-being. And what I would be focusing on is women in astronomy. Because like Shruti mentioned, uh, I'm also the co-chair of the Women in Astronomy Working Group of the International Astronomical Union. And it's not just because of that. It's not just because I'm a woman, but it's because it's something that we all need to be concerned about. And that's what I would tell you about. Because when we are using the words global, global science, global well-being, obviously women comprise 50% of that. Uh, and through my talk today, I would actually try to show to you why it has been somehow things have been not very fair for women in astronomy. And therefore, uh, you know, steps need to be taken to correct that. And I would describe the kind of steps that we are trying to take. And I would obviously welcome any kind of suggestions from the viewers on what they, they think would be good things to uh, work on this. Right. So I'll, I'll just get on to this. And um, another alternate title I've mentioned over here, She Sees Stars. Women Astronomers in Time is approximately something similar. So now, uh, women in astronomy, unfortunately, have been the unsung heroes in astronomy, right? And I'll actually try to show myself, yeah, <clears throat> how women actually, in principle, they did do things which actually made history. I will actually point out to you a few women who have actually made very historical discoveries which have, you know, been very important in astronomy. But some of these things have been neglected and these people have, you know, the, somehow the world has not been very fair to them. But yeah, I'll just talk a, few, a little bit about these women astronomers. Who are they? And uh, let us see what were what, what their lives all about and what was the issues that we're talking about. So if we go back, way back, there is Hippatia, who is one of the oldest women astronomers who's been, you know, who's been uh, about there's some written data about her. She was actually um, a long time back in Alexandria, Egypt, and she was the head of the Neoplatonic school, taught philosophy astronomer. She was the first female, female mathematician whose life was reasonably well recorded. One thing I would also like to highlight in this talk is that how in the good old times, uh, we did not have this segregation between subjects. You could be an astronomer, a physicist, uh, a mathematician, a musician, all of them put in one. While the segregation that we have done into the you know different disciplines, now we have come to a time where we realize that we need to do interdisciplinary, where you know the physicists need to talk to the mathematicians and the statisticians, as well as the chemists or maybe even the biologists. So Hippatia actually, she was the first one who was actually employed as a teacher. But unfortunately, you can see that this was something that society did not accept very well. Though she was an established prominent thinker in Alexandria, but uh, finally, when she actually met her end, it was she was murdered by a mob of Christians because often the results or the things that astronomers spoke about were not very much liked by the Christians, by the church. It went against the church. Uh, let's move ahead. So, uh, Hippatia is one of the first, but let's go on to more modern times uh, for whom we have more recorded history. So if you look at Mary Somerville, Somerville who is like more than you know, almost 250 years ago, she was a scientist writer polymath. She studied maths and astronomy. And uh, she was actually elected together with Carolyn Herschel. And you can see that there's a list of the kind of work she worked on, on the sun as well as various other aspects, uh, which actually made her a very qualified astronomer. And then we have Carolyn Herschel, which is one of the other astronomers who you know, uh, in this case, we will see in a few of these cases, Carolyn Herschel actually worked with her brother. Her brother was the, you know, he was the astronomer and she was the younger sister of William Herschel. And she kind of assisted him in his work, but she was herself very good at her work, due to which she was finally awarded the gold medal by the Royal Astronomical Society. She was an honorary member of the, um, of the Royal Irish Academy, etc. And she was the first recorded astronomer to actually have a professional salary paid to a woman in England for astronomy. And she actually discovered many, several comets. She was a very good, keen astronomer. So in principle, assisted her brother, but she made a name for herself also, Caroline Herschel. So there is a, a comet also named after her, which she discovered. We had Maria Mitchell 200 years ago, who was also a um, she was also the first woman to work as a professional astronomer, professor of astronomy. 
and she accepted the position at Vassar College. And even Vassar College to this date is a very leading institution for women in astronomy. And you can see that she achieved quite a few things in her this thing again she discovered a comet because those were the times when observations of comets nebulous objects was considered cutting edge research in astronomy and that's what uh, like carolyn herschel even maria mitchell went on to doing things like that and then when we come to more modern times say 100 years ago you have margaret burbage margaret burbage actually did she was a fellow of the royal society and she actually did very seminal work on nuclear synthesis Nuclear synthesis is the study in astronomy which actually talks about the origin of elements. Unfortunately, when we are taught chemistry in school, we are never taught as to how do the elements come about, right? Why do we have a certain abundance of hydrogen, helium, gold, iron in the universe? While nuclear synthesis is that branch of astronomy which actually studies how and why do we have certain elements right in our universe and it also explains the important thing about nuclear synthesis is it also explains the abundance of of materials right it tells you why do you have a certain abundance now she actually worked with william fowler and uh, that was obviously recognized to be a nobel prize winning work for which fowler actually got the nobel prize in 1983 but unfortunately the nobel committee refused to even acknowledge the contribution of Margaret Burbage in his work. And, uh, you know, though the Nobel was given to Fowler, but Burbage's contribution was just ignored. It was just neglected, as though it didn't exist. Right? So, um, <clears throat> but Margaret Burbage is a very interesting story to read about. It's very interesting to read about her life because I think she's a perfect example of how she actually fought against the system, which was definitely not very conducive for women in astronomy. But for example, one example of her, you know, her grit is, for example, the American Astronomical Society, uh, you know, was awarding her uh, the award in 1972 for a woman astronomer. This is a reserved uh, award, Annie Jump Cannon Award, which is given to women in astronomy. And Margaret Burbage actually refused the award because she said, I do not want discrimination of any kind. I do not want to even get an award which is just reserved for women. She said, I would compete for normal awards, but I don't want this kind of reservation. And therefore, uh, Margaret Burbage rejected the award in 1972. And finally, later on, she actually got in 1984, the American Astronomical Society gave her the Russell Lectureship, which is an award without any uh, reservation for women. And that's the kind of award which she agreed to take. And I think that is the kind of approach which women today need to take, where we actually, uh, you know, kind of oppose reservation, because somehow reservation gives people the impression that you need to be, you know, rules need to be relaxed for you, that you need to have, you know, lesser amount of qualifications or lesser amount of merit to win the race, right? While uh, the example that Margaret Burbage set was something like, we can still compete and we can still win awards, without any reservation, right? So I would actually uh, very much support the kind of idea she had that uh, women in astronomy today should compete and should compete on, uh, you know, on, on firm ground where there is no bias, neither to women nor to women, men, because that's the kind of perfect, you know, world we'd like to live in, where there is no bias and people get awarded for what they do, irrespective of gender or any other aspect. So uh, Margaret Burbage continued her struggle through various methods. You could actually read about her life very well. And finally, uh, she actually became the director of the Royal, Royal Greenwich Observatory, which was a very big uh, you know, honor to have in her times. And uh, she also played a very important role in developing the faint object spectrograph for the Hubble Space Telescope and uh, you know, various other great astronomy achievements. I should also say that along with her, her husband, Jeffrey Burbage was also an astronomer, though he worked more on the theoretical side, while Margaret was worked more on the observational side. But however, together as a team, as a couple, they did um, complement each other's achievements. And, uh, you know, uh, I'm sure I, I would say he definitely did play a very important role in her career in astronomy. We come to someone more recent, uh, more than uh, uh, Margaret Burbage, which is Vera Rubin. Vera Rubin is a very 
she she actually came up with a very important discovery which is the problem of dark matter now those of you all who know some amount of astronomy you would have uh, there is something called the galaxy rotation curves that is we actually plot the velocity of stars versus the distance from the center of the galaxy of those stars now in a general case one would have expected with a gravitational law a 1 by r square kind of law you would see that as stars are away from the center of the galaxy their velocity should fall as a 1 by r square right which is given by newton's law of gravity but what vera rubin found is that she found that instead of this fall you actually had a flattening off and you actually had a slight increase in the velocity of stars in the outskirts of galaxies and that was explained using the concept of dark matter which basically states that galaxies are actually embedded within dark matter halos and that is why in the outer regions of galaxies you do have large velocities of stars so vera rubin is very important to uh, take it as, as an example because when she actually observed this through her observations she was observing this thing through galaxy rotation curves this was obviously very counterintuitive this was very much against what people were observing or studying right because like i said newton's law of gravity is something very sacrosanct for astronomers and therefore the one one by r squared law was what was expected now what she found through her observations was something very different where you actually had an increase in velocities right and uh, which could be explained only with dark matter so vera rubin also gets credited with the idea of you actually come out with ideas against the system right against the existing system she actually proposed the existence of dark matter to explain her galaxy rotation curves because she was very confident about the observations she got she knew that there's nothing wrong in her observations there's definitely an increase in velocity of stars as they move to the outskirts and um, so another one of the this things from vera rubin we can learn is her um, you know bravery comes in different ways but there's also bravery of a kind when you are opposing the the standard models what people actually think and you actually show confidence in what you observe on the results you get and she came out with this very uh, novel idea of dark matter which even to this date it's controversial and it's not very easily acceptable by the community but it is now a very well established fact that there does exist dark matter in the universe for which we actually give credit to vera rubin another very important group of astronomers are what are called the harvard astronomers this is in the smithsonian astrophysical observatory this is in near harvard this is in boston Cam cambridge in the us and you actually had the observatory over there where they were observing with photographic plates now at that time the di the director of the observatory was edward edward pickering okay and uh, to actually inspect the photographic plates you needed some very skilled astron workers who could actually study the photographic plates catalog the objects they observe and put them in a you know in a in a, in a very uh, tabulated systematic manner and for which for which you needed what were called the computers the computers were actually a set of people who computed all these values using the photographic plates tabulated it and set very important records amongst these you had anne jam kanan kanan you had henrietta leavitt cecilia payne and joanna maury these are very well uh, at that time they were considered to be just the computers but later on it was realized that these computers actually played a very important uh, role in astronomy now at this point what was considered is that this was very monotonous work and therefore the astronomers of the observatory did not spend their time in this you actually had the computers who were these set of women who were often even called pickering's harem who were actually doing this work but we see that in the process of doing this work these women they came up with some very very important results in astronomy and uh, for example henrietta leavitt henrietta leavitt was one of the women uh, you know the harvard computers and what she did is she observed what are called cepheid variables now cepheid variables are very important to objects because you see in this uh, in these images these are pulsating stars okay so they expand and they contract due to which there is a difference in their brightness and this difference in brightness can be observed to have a certain periodicity and if you plot what you see in the lower plot you have luminosity versus period you can see that there's a direct relationship between the absolute luminosity of these stars and their period 
And therefore, if you observe these stars and you measure their period, you can actually find out their absolute luminosity. Now, the absolute luminosity is the luminosity if you have of an object with a known distance. What you observe is what is called the apparent luminosity for an unknown distance. So once you know your absolute luminosity and the apparent luminosity of an object, you can find out the distance to an object. And therefore, CPET variables, they are considered as what are called standard candles. Okay, It's, for example, you have a 100-watt bulb and you place it at different distances. You see its brightness fall. But since you know its brightness is 100 watts, you can directly infer what is the distance at which this bulb has been put away from you. Exactly in the same way, for these CPET variables, you could actually compute the distance to these variables because you just observe the period, the period of the change in the brightness, right? And this is what was discovered by Henrietta Levitt, which by laboriously studying all these photographic plates, which had data of these CPET variables. And therefore, these are called standard candles. Now, why are standard candles important and specifically the ones observed by Henrietta Levitt? You may, you may all know that obviously galaxies are large collections of stars, gas and dust, right? And one of the important things we know is we know about Edwin Hubble. What Edwin Hubble did is he actually observed the spectra of galaxies and using the Doppler effect, he actually measured the velocities of these galaxies, right? So the Doppler effect, what does it tell you? That if you have a moving source of light, which is emitting a certain wavelength, right? Then depending on its velocity, the wavelength gets shifted. So what Hubble actually found is that for galaxies in our neighborhood, they all seem to move with velocities which are directly proportional to their distance. So the, the spectra that Hubble observed, with that he found out the velocities. But the distances to the galaxies, which you see on his x-axis, this distance of his was find out, found out using observations of cepheids in extragalactic objects in other galaxies. So cepheids are very bright variables. And therefore what happened is that for the galaxies where Hubble observed, he could observe cepheid variables. Using cepheid variables, he could find out the distances to those galaxies. And based on that, he could get this plot, which is called Hubble's law, which is basically the plot of velocity versus distance. So the distance, the x-axis which Hubble had, was actually based on the study of Henrietta Levitt of CPE variables. And based on that, Hubble came up with his theory, which is formula, which is V is equal to H0 into D. V is the velocity of the galaxy, H0 is Hubble's constant, and D is the distance of the galaxy. And this basically is the basis for our understanding of what is called the expansion of the universe. That is, we say that galaxies, if this is the Milky Way, as the distance of the galaxy increases from the Milky Way, its velocity increases, right? And therefore, my V is equal to H0 into D. The velocity increases, which is this plot which you see, what Hubble found out. And this actually gives us the theory of the expanding universe. If you reverse this in time, you'll say that all the galaxies were at one point of time before the expansion started. And that point of point time is what we call the Big Bang. So the Big Bang is the initiated or the starting at which this expansion of the universe takes place, right? And the basis of Hubble's law is, like I told you, the contribution from Henrietta Levitt of Cepheid variables. And so that actually gives us the understanding of Hubble's law, speed versus distance, and that's what we actually got, right? Another very important astronomer who was also one of the Harvard computers was Annie Jump Cannon. And what Annie Jump Cannon is, what she did is she observed the spectra of galaxies. And based on the spectra of galaxies, she actually classified galaxies into what are called spectral types. Now, um, I would just show you over here. This is an example of the spectra of galaxies. So when you observe it, you would observe something like this. This is a continuum spectra, which is telling you emission from all wavelengths. This is shorter to longer wavelengths. And on these wavelengths, you may have what are called absorption lines, which are the black lines, or you could have emission lines, which are brighter lines. This can be interpreted in the form of a spectrum over here, where you have this is the continuum spectrum, 
and here you have your absorption lines at various wavelengths okay i'm just showing you the spectra to give you an idea that what annie jam cannon did was she looked at data like this okay data like this on a photographic plate which she converted to plots like this right where you actually have a flux of stars which this is the continuum spectrum on which you have absorption lines or you could have emission lines like this and based on this looking on the spectra she classified these stars into different spectral types the different spectral types are mentioned over here o b a f g etc these were the different spectral class right so o was the hottest kind of stars and m were the coldest kind of stars and uh, basically it is you know to remember the sequence when she discovered it she did not realize the temperature sequence but if you put it in a temperature sequence it comes as o b a fine girl kiss me so o is hottest b a fine girl kiss me right so what she actually did is she classified the spectra and i am actually showing the spectra to you to give you an idea of what kind of a laborious task was this you are looking at data of this kind converting it to plots of this kind and then classifying these plots for all the spectra which were observed to actually put stars into spectral classes and then realizing that these spectral classes is actually a temperature sequence in the sense it's it's they're showing you what is the spectrum of hot stars to cold stars where o type stars are the hottest and m type are the coolest so this is the kind of work that henry that any jump canon had to do was to look at these spectra classify them and actually give you the different spectral classes and spectral classes are very important thing in the study of spectral of stellar evolution and stellar formation and uh, it's something very very important because temperature is a very important parameter in the study of stars and therefore what um, any jump canon did is something very very important another very important uh, harvard astronomer was cecilia payne and cecilia payne actually in her doctoral thesis she actually inferred that stars are made mainly comprised of hydrogen and helium this is basically dated on spectra of stars and again cecilia payne her result was it contradicted the scientific wisdom of that time because at that time what was considered is that the universe has elemental abundance similar to the sun and the earth and therefore what she actually inferred was something very controversial but that is what she put in her doctoral thesis and therefore i think we really need to uh, you know uh, acknowledge her contribution again in the sense of going against method going against the you know the, the knowledge of the, those times another more recent astronomer is joycelyn bell joycelyn bell actually worked on a phd thesis in the university of cambridge and she worked with anthony huish basically to conduct co construct a radio telescope the idea was to study interplanetary scintillation to study quasars and kind of accidentally she observed signals from what was called the little green men now what it basically meant is that it was pulsating signals which were coming with a certain pulse by pulse i mean a certain periodicity and this was the discovery of pulsars so initially what was considered joycelyn bell what found they thought it was some kind of an alien signal but then joycelyn bell repeated her uh, observations studied them in real detail and inferred that this is from a natural process and these were what were then inferred to be what are called pulsars so this was a very major accidental discovery again in the case of joycelyn bell this was considered nobel worthy and therefore a nobel prize was given in 1974 but it was given to her thesis supervisor because the nobel committee said that joycelyn bell was just a student the work was basically the idea of the supervisor but the supervisor in principle i would argue is actually he constructed the radio telescope to study interplanetary scintillation he did not know that he is going to be discovering pulsars he was studying scintillation it was kind of by accident that they discovered pulsars and therefore definitely credit should have been given to joycelyn bell which was not given by the nobel committee however 50 years after her significant role she actually won the 3 million breakthrough prize okay and uh, for her very same discovery for which she did not get the nobel and joycelyn bell <coughs> she uh, 
you, you, she she's a very interesting person where she actually then uh, contributed the complete amount of her award to actually um, fund PhD scholarships for underrepresented physics students in the UK as well as to help elevate the country's um, astronomy listing, especially for women. So she contributed all her prize money just for that. Another more recent astronomer is Andrea Gaze, who actually got the Nobel Prize in 2020 for actually using observations to estimate the mass of the supermassive black hole, which we have in the center of our galaxy, which is a black hole of about a before time, you know, it's about a million suns, 10 past six, the mass of the sun. And she did this by using very laborious observations, which span more than 20 years of stars near the center of the galaxy. So what they did is they used near infrared observations uh, using um, the VLT, and they actually observed stars near the center of the galaxy and observed, uh, used their orbit parameters to measure the mass of the black hole sitting in the center of the galaxy. And uh, so that's the that's the thing about a few of the astronomers. What you must have noticed that we've not yet touched upon any Indian astronomers. And therefore now we'll come back home. Most of you all are aware of the strong contribution, the major contribution made by women in the space program. Many of you all may have heard of these women, Nandini Harinath, Sita uh, Somasundaram, Minal Rohit. There are various women who have played a very important role in the Indian space program. And uh, <clears throat> there's even a movie made about it. And I think the uh, public awareness about the female contribution in ISRO has grown a lot, even thanks to the Bollywood movie, as well as, uh, you know, the, the, you know, people are now aware of the contribution. Similarly, so there are a lot of women in astronomy in, in ISRO. And uh, so some of them are, for example, she is the, the Latambika, she actually is leading the Gaganyan mission. The Gaganyan mission is the Indian mission to actually send uh, man in space, which is an ongoing mission. It should be completed in a few years from now. You have an, uh, the other two women, uh, Mutaya Vanita as well as Ritu Karidal, who were the women behind the Chandrayaan 2 mission. Right? And uh, <clears throat> I think I'm running out of time. There's Anuradha, who is the senior most women scientist at, at ISRO. And uh, I don't have time, but you could actually, there's a nice book about them. You could actually see it. So there are lots of women who are in ISRO. ISRO. There was also, there's also G.C. Anupama. The first time the Astronomical Society of India actually had a female president. She was the last president of the Astronomical Society from the Institute of Astrophysics. The Institute of Astrophysics also has a female director now, who is Annapurni Subramaniam. There's Chanda Jog, who's a very well reputed scientist in India. I am sorry that I'm not adding more, but there are many more women astronomers in India who are working. But if you actually look at the stats, what are the stats which we have for women? If you were to actually see, this is a picture of the General Assembly of the International Astronomical Union in 1928. And you can see that in this very picture, the, uh, these are the only women in this picture. You can count them. One, two, three, four, five, six. That's it. The rest of the members in the General Assembly in 1928 were all men. You can see that um, even in 1932, you don't see much of an in improvement. You see a few more women, but it's still not very well represented. If you actually see the stats of women in the International Astronomical Union, you could see it was barely 10%. And now recently we've barely come to 20%, which is still not what we would like, right? The, if you actually make a split as per the age, this thing, you can see with the younger generation, we've already reached 30-40%, which is already good. But the older generation, we still have a very low contribution of women. And therefore, it was realized, and obviously, this is a, you know, goes beyond saying, if you actually see the, the capabilities of women, obviously, it's beyond doubt. But there is this very important problem, which is called the scissors problem, or the leaking pipe problem. If you actually see in high school students, the proportion of female or male students in physics and astronomy is, you know, not exactly 50-50, but it's pretty good. But as we go to higher levels, you know, you see in bachelors, you already have a fall in PhD. And then when you go on to what are called full professors, you'll see that clearly 90%, 95% are all men. And less than that, less than 5% is women. And this is what is called the leaking pipe problem. That is, you start off with a close to 50-50 thing. But as you go to higher you know, positions, you have a fall in this number. 
right? And this is called the leaking pipe or the scissors problem. And uh, therefore, what things need to be done again. Again, the same thing which I'm showing you over here, that as you go to students, you could have a close to, you know, 60, uh, 60, 35 percent. But as you go to higher positions, full professors, you barely have a contribution of women compared to men, right? The women are barely 5, 10, 15 percent, while men are much more. And therefore, something has to be done about that. If you look in the U.S. also, we, I don't have a picture for India, but if you actually see in the U.S., ideally this image should be a reflection of the population. But you can clearly see that even in, in the U.S., you have the white male, which is 51% of the people in astronomy, 18% is the, is the white female, and a very small percentage, 30% is left for the rest of the population. So you can clearly see that this is not representative of the population, right? Which is what should actually it should be. The key issues are what? We need to educate women. We need to recruit them, get them into jobs. We need to help retain them because often these women, once they get jobs, then they have families, they have children, they have issues, they drop their jobs. And we need to sensitize places of work where they realize that women do have issues in actually staying on in their job and they should be given certain facilities. Simple facilities like childcare, etc., should be considered in all institutions for women. So therefore, the International Astronomical Union set up a chair, a uh, working group for women in astronomy, of which I am the co-chair. This is the chair, this is Mamta Tomier. And we have a very good working group, which is trying to work into actually see into how can we actually try to, you know, improve this problem. We basically have a four-point program. Number one is bringing up the awareness of the program. I have been focusing a lot on the training and the skill building because I believe that if women have skills, they have training, then everybody will want to employ them and they will find their, you know, they will find their positions. Another important thing that we are working on is fundraising, getting funds for women and communication. There should be participation of women researchers setting up communication between them, right? And therefore, we've been doing various things. The fraction of women in the IEO is still low, it, but now we are trying to increase it. What is being done is uh, it is being trying to see that in IU symposia and IU meetings, we actually see to it that there are more women. IU is trying to see that in leadership positions, you have more women and their actions to increase the diversity. So here is the gender distribution in 2015. I don't have a more recent plot, but you can see that it's kind of better in South America. There's Argentina over here. India is only about 1 to 10%. But when we move ahead, it's kind of improved in 2018. We have moved to about 20%, but we still need to improve our numbers. You can see some countries have it better. But for example, you would be surprised to see that North America, Europe, India, Australia, we still fall within the 20% packet. So where various, uh, like I said, some of the actions to promote is more women in high IU positions, the working group we have. We are trying to see that there are more women in symposia, we have women in astronomy lunches. You have you know, various things being done. And um, there have been various IU presidents, women. Even the last president we had, Deborah M. Green. We've had a lot of women presidents, which was done basically to ensure that you know, things are being done to um, approach this problem, find solutions to the problem. If you see the IU officers, the 2015 to 2018 batch, you have a three by four contribution of women. Then more recent one, again, you have three women versus one man. And now you have a 50-50. This is the ideal contribution where we have 50-50. And uh, <clears throat> this is the contribution which we have. The assistant general secretary also, we, we did have women. And uh, division presidents, it's been trying to ensure that we do have a good amount of division presidents who are women. So now in the division presidents, we have five women, four men, and which is obviously a good thing. We also trying to ensure that in scientific meetings, we are actually keeping account of the participants, invited speakers and contributed speakers to actually see what is the female contribution. We have women in astronomy lunches at the General Assembly where this is basically discussed. It's open to all, obviously men and women, to basically discuss issues and actually see what can be done. We have International School for Young Astronomers. This is not reserved for women, but obviously you do have a good amount of women participation within the school, right? And PhD prizes, again, here there's no reservation to women, but you can clearly see that there are women 
who are actually winning, winning the prizes in spite of there being no reservation, right? Which is a very good sign. You also have the group of fellowship. You can actually see in uh, many of them, you do have a good amount of women versus men actually getting the awards, right? And um, that's a good thing. Like I said, the ideal situation where you have a 50-50 kind of thing without reservations. There's also the IU uh, Women and Girls in Astronomy Initiative, which actually has a various activities being done to highlight the contribution of women and girls in astronomy, various things being done, various projects, and uh, some of them are shown over here, and uh, various things. Along with that, IU tries to actually be more inclusive. So it's not only about women, it's also about including people who are, uh, you know, so you have certain tactile models being men for, uh, for example, where, uh, you know, children who, are, who have seeing problems, they can actually use these tactile models to actually understand and feel the surface of various planets or, uh, you know, this thing. So a lot of work is being done even in IAU to be very inclusive, to include, include uh, people with disabilities as well as various ethnic groups. And uh, therefore, we actually hope that with that, we can actually, um, you know, it, it could be not, it's not only about women, but actually including various diverse groups of people as well as. So in IU General Assemblies, often there are these kind of, uh, you know, for the for the plenary talks, there are often things where actually, which is done specifically for the deaf and dumb students, so that they could actually uh, listen to the, the, uh, the, the talks, the plenary talks. And uh, basically, it basically works at the four point program. So uh, we would, I would like to end with this, where we'd actually wish for a world where there's actually a freedom of choice, where people can actually choose their professions, pick up their subjects. There could be equal opportunity for men and women, and a world where there is no requirement for reservation, where women can actually get their positions without reservations, neither for awards nor for positions. And where the individual is non-gender, because uh, in that, that would be, I think, an ideal world where actually there is what we call equal opportunity and freedom of choice. People can choose the profession they want, but there is no bias where, you know, women are not doing science or things like that. You could have men not doing science if they like. It's just a question of choice, right? And I think that freedom of choice and equal opportunity is something which we would all like to work for. And that would be an ideal kind of world we would look for. So thanks so much. I'll end with this, uh, with just a good quote about astronomy. That astronomy is useful because it raises us above ourselves. It's useful because it's grand. It shows us how small is man's body. You can see in Poncares, this should have actually been woman's body or whoever's, you know, man was the general of this thing. How great is her mind since her intelligence can embrace the whole of this dazzling immensity where her body is only an obscure point and enjoy its silent harmony. So one would work for something of that kind. So thanks so much. I'll end with this and I'd be happy to take questions. Hi ma'am, thank you so much. Uh, it was a really inspiring session and uh, I'm actually uh, really encouraged by seeing Margaret Verbert's story actually. And as well as uh, I'm surprised to find the number of women uh, astronomers still low in uh, India as well as USA. Uh, but I I like the quote, uh, the edit in the quote, which you did in the end of the session. Uh, now uh, we can have some questions. So in the, there are some general questions. And apart from that, uh, there's one question which a student from um, Ryan International, Ryan, Ryan International Vasant Punch has asked. Saran Sharma is a student's name. And he's not able to understand the Hubble's law, uh, which you have mentioned. Can you uh, explain that a bit? Yeah. So, like I said, the Hubble's law is very simple. V is equal. You basically what Hubble observed is that the velocity of galaxies, right, which he found from the spectra, was directly proportional to the distance of the galaxy. That means the further the galaxy was from us, the faster it seemed to be moving away from us. Okay. So what Hubble found is that all these galaxies are moving away from us, and their velocity is directly proportional to the distance. So V is proportional to D. And if you write it as V is equal to, the constant of proportionality was called Hubble's constant, which is H naught into D. And what he basically said is that the further galaxies away from us, 
the faster it seems to move so just think of it like a you know like a balloon the center part moves at a smaller velocity but the outer part moves at a larger velocity so this was the uh, the basis of our understanding of the expanding universe that the universe is expanding because what is closer to us is moving slowly but what is further away is moving faster it's it's kind of expanding uh, not exactly like a balloon but kind of like that uh, okay well, thank you so much the next question is from ishan uh, from mount st mary's school delhi uh, he is asking what is quantum foam quantum foam f o a m yeah f o a m yeah oh i really don't know so <laughs> i'm sorry i don't know i would have to i can actually cheat and google but i would <laughs> do that i can if okay. you want i can do that but uh, uh, i actually don't know it's an interesting thing for me also to see So if I Google it says it's a theoretical quantum fluctuation of space time on very small scales due to quantum mechanics. Okay. So uh, yeah. Okay. So this I understand. So actually, as on the basis of quantum mechanics, we actually say that there's a certain amount of uncertainty, right? If you must have heard of the uncertainty principle, which basically tells you that you cannot find the position and momentum of a particle at the same time. Yeah. There's always going to be an error. and therefore what happens is there's always a quantum fluctuation in space time we cannot find everything definitely right and therefore based on this you can actually this this theory actually predicts that particles of matter and antimatter are constantly created and destroyed and uh, these are virtual particles and uh, so that's the quantum form so it's basically the quantum fluctuation of space time okay thank you Uh, the next question is from uh, Vaishali, uh, Chennai Public School Global. Uh, she's from eighth standard, and she wants to know: Is it possible that the moon might escape the Earth's gravity? No, actually, you know, you would be very interested to know that the moon is um, uh, is actually locked. It is in a tidal lock condition, in which the the you know the period of rotation and revolution of the moon is exactly the same, and that is why you are all the time seeing. the same face of the moon you never see the dark side or the far side of the moon because this is what is called tidal locking the the the, the moon is locked in that position and actually the moon is coming closer to us uh every year uh right it's actually not going away from us it's actually coming closer to us by a few centimeters uh, oh sorry it's moving up uh, sorry it's moving slightly further away about an inch it moves about an inch further every year so in principle in the long run it could actually move right because it's uh, you know it's moving away from us this is basically being caused because of tidal forces okay and uh, so it's gradually very gradually moving away but it's like an inch per year so eventually it could should but it is moving at a very slow rate so yes it is moving away from us by an inch an okay. inch Yes, thank you. Uh, the next question is uh, from Saurajit Mandal, uh, Maithi Kiran High School, and he wants to ask. He's from eighth standard again, and wants to ask. According to some articles, the JWST has found six massive galaxies which formed only around two hundred million years after Big Bang. Yeah. So could that be an indication that Big Bang ever happened? and uh, i would like to ask i would like to add to this question so uh, i heard i saw an article which showed that the uh, star they they found the age of a star which is higher than the uh, age of big bang that is 13.8 billion years ago so is it possible that the big bang never happened what do you think ma'am okay so uh, actually uh, hubble's law which i showed you v is equal to h not into d let me say h not we are calling it hubble's constant right but there is reason to believe that uh, rather we have observational data that the expansion of the universe is not happening at a constant velocity okay uh, the the nobel prize a few years back went for the discovery of accelerating universe so actually the universe is not just ex- expanding at a constant velocity it's with an acceleration which is called dark energy and you know there's an expansion of the universe taking place and therefore the the uh, the I'll, i'll first address your question the idea of the age of the universe it is you know if you just invert hubble's law right you say what is the distance at uh, what is the reverse age of the universe from hubble's law you can find out the age of the universe 
that is obviously assuming that hubble's constant is a constant but now we know that hubble's constant is not a constant because there's an acceleration of the universe so if you change the cosmological models the age of the universe will also change right and therefore we have there, there is what is even called the hubble tension right where people are actually um, hubble's law is a very simplified version if for physics students that is what is called a linear approximation the first order it is the first order equation but there is of definitely a change in the hubble constant also with time and so there there's been a change in the hubble's constant with time our calculation of the age of the universe is different right and therefore when we uh, the, the the star in james rabi there are two things one is uh, we verifying the calculation of the age of that star number one and number two is we calculating the age of the universe based on more recent cosmological models right because uh, now when you're putting the change in hubble's constant etc then you do have these problems due to which things don't fit in so uh, there is what is called the hubble tension where people are now concerned about hubble's law and the actual value it works as a linear approximation but it seems to be an approximation we it needs to be further studied so that answers your question that those both things need to be recalculated and confirmed the age of the star as well as the age of the universe uh, the other question which was about james webb galaxies um, see that those galaxies are already after 200 million years of the formation of the universe right so we still have 200 million years in which the galaxies can form agreed it is difficult to form galaxies at that point of time because as our with our understanding of cosmology we thought that galaxies form much later in the universe but they do not form that early in the universe now uh, agreed so the so the results of james webb have actually got people uh, into thinking as to how can you actually produce galaxies at such an early stage and what has also been found is that many of these galaxies have very good uh, structures also you know they have uh, spiral arms they have disks you know which actually take time to form and therefore it is uh, we still have a lot of um, mysteries about galaxy formation and uh, we actually do not understand that so the first question which was there we do not actually know the answer of it we know that the big bang seems to fit Okay, ma'am. Um, uh, thank you. And uh, next question is from Arav Shekhar, again from Ryan International School. Uh, he's in seventh standard, and he's asking uh, one of the famous question: uh, What is dark matter? What is what is what? Dark matter. Dark matter. Oh, that's thank you. That's an interesting thing. So, if you remember when I showed you Vera Rubens, right? So, what happens is. dark matter goes as per the name it is dark in the sense uh, when you actually look at the outskirts of galaxies we see that stars seem to be moving with a large velocity which basically implies that there is mass in the outer parts of the galaxies but the problem is through observations in various uh, wavelengths we do not find any objects lying in that region and therefore dark matter is the matter which does not seem to emit any light we do not see any light coming from that matter but we do see the gravitational influence of that matter right and therefore there is matter for sure but it is not emitting radiation now there are various um, uh, you know potential things which could be dark matter for example you could have a bunch of black holes which actually provide dark matter because they have to show their presence gravitationally but not through emission which could be the these this dark matter so we do not exactly know how can we fill the universe with 95% of these candidate dark matter objects so it's still a, a thing in which there's a lot of research being going on people are trying to study it it's not very simple to study it for the simple reason that this matter is dark 
and basically in astronomy what we do is we observe so we are basically observing radiation coming from objects in x ray gamma ray optical infrared in various wavelengths but this material the problem is it doesn't emit right it's dark and we can only see it through uh, its gravitational influence so like for example the orbits of stars or for example through gravitational lensing it's very interesting that gravity also behaves like a lens okay it can actually bend um, it can bend light and behave like a lens exactly like a lens and that can also be used as a very good dark matter estimate so either you observe measure velocities or you see this but um, so that's the deal that dark matter is still a very um, a hot topic in astronomy which is being studied so I, we do not have all the answers to your questions yeah Okay, well, thank you. And the next question is from Sanshreya Satwal, uh, I think Delhi Public School, 8th standard. Uh, Ma'am, what are the qualifications required to become an astronaut? Astronaut? Yeah. Yeah. Can add for astronomer as well, Ma'am. Ah, so actually, uh, astronauts and astronomers are two different kind of people, right? So if you actually see Rakesh Sharma, who was the first Indian astronaut, he was actually an Air Force pilot, right? So essentially, astronauts have to be tough people. You have to be strong because um, the whole launch process and going out in space is a physically strenuous process. And therefore, an astronaut needs to be physically strong, physically fit, right? And therefore, like, for example, Rakesh Sharma was recruited. He was an Air Force pilot and he was, you know, he both the, the, the uh, you know, uh, the, 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 you know, the, the Indian astronauts were selected. They were from the Air Force. So typically pilots, Air Force people are the ones who were sent as astronauts. But then later on, there was a change, especially in NASA, where they even sent school teachers, right? They even sent various other kind of uh, people into space because um, uh, basically to make it more inclusive, right? To let other kind of people go in. But uh, essentially, uh, you know, so, in, so for the Indian case, that is the this thing that you know through the air force through pilots etc while uh, in the us uh, many more people can apply for but obviously fitness is something very very important right uh, qualifications are not so important because astronauts carry out experiments but they are not scientists they're not necessarily scientists they can be scientists but they needn't be scientists but to be an astronomer an astronomer is a scientist a scientist uh, obviously has to know physics, maths, and preferably even computers. So you need to know, you need to have a master's, say in physics or in mathematics, and then you can go for a PhD program in physics, mathematics, astronomy, in various places in the country, as well as abroad. And uh, uh, so for th that's the kind of thing you'd have to do for that. For ISRO kind of jobs, I'm just adding that on my own, because um, while, while students keep saying, I want to join NASA, I tell them you need to join ISRO, right? That is your home institution. Yes. And for ISRO, the bulk of people who are in, they are engineers because they have to be building the instruments, building the material, right? So these are engineers. So if you are an engineer, it could be any branch, civil, mechanical, electronic, whatever. Uh, regularly, ISRO actually has advertisements where they advertise for positions and some of them are through uh, exams, you need to give tests. Some of them are through interviews. And uh, so ISRO would be through engineering, right? So, yeah. Yes, ma'am, thank you. And uh, last question, then we can wrap up the uh, session, ma'am. Uh, this is from Daiki uh, from Prudence School, 8th standard. Uh, what interests you most in astronomy? Okay, actually astronomy, I love the whole of it. So it's very difficult for me to say what interests me the most because I like it all. Uh, <clears throat> it has been a subject I wanted since I was barely 12 years old and it's continued as that. Uh, but uh, what I've been focusing more is, uh, uh, you know, one of the basic questions we basically ask is about the origin of life, right? About the origin of life, about the origin, basically at the level of origin. So I have been studying the origin of stars basically because we know that when stars form along with them form planets and planets are the place where you can have life forming and therefore if you want to study the formation of life you have to start off with stars see star formation what is the thing about star formation which stars actually have planets planetary systems and then which of those planetary systems can actually have life 
So I, I would say I study more of stars, planets, this thing. But I do work also on galaxies. I like galaxies too. They're beautiful structures and specifically studying galaxy morphology. Because the interesting thing about galaxy morphology is, uh, you know, what you're seeing the shape of a galaxy is basically the orbits of stars, right? So for example, an elliptical galaxy is a galaxy in which stars have random orientation. And that's why the whole the galaxy looks like an egg or something like that, because all the stars have random orientations. Well, if you have a disk galaxy, then for some reason, all these stars are just going along a disk and uh, they are, you know, there's just rotation happening over there. And it's obviously therefore very interesting that how do you have systems in which the orbits of stars get so very well regularized, you know, to actually have random values, to have a disk value, to have spiral arms in the disk, to have a bar, you know, to have double cores. Yeah. And I think even that's why the even the morphology of galaxies interests me a lot as to how do you actually have billions of stars to have yet regularized orbits. You know, to give you that morphological shape. I think that's very fascinating. How do you, you know, regularize these orbits like that? Okay. Thank you so much, ma'am, for answering. And thank you, Apple, for taking your time to interact with the students. And I'm sure all the students are uh, as in inspired as me. And I also want to thank our viewers as well as the students for activ actively participating in this event, asking up questions. And I'm sure they have followed Sir C.V. Raman's statement that ask the right questions and nature will open up the doors to her secrets. So I once again wish you all a happy National Science Day. Keep exploring and happy science. Thanks so much. Happy Thank science you. day to everyone. Thank you so much.